This week's episode of the And She Looked Up podcast is brought to you by Fine Lime Illustrations. If you love quirky, colorful art transformed into fun, handmade stationery items, pretty much guaranteed to brighten somebody's day, that's just what you'll find in my new online shop at finelimeillustrations.com. That's fine, as in I'm fine, lime as in the fruit, illustrations.com. Browse the entire collection or sign up for my email list to see some behind the scenes peeks into my studio. You'll also get first notice of new product launches and subscriber only sales. And as an added little bonus, you'll also receive a free coloring sheet to help you relax and de-stress from your day. And now on with the show. Welcome to the And She Looked Up podcast. Each week, we sit down with inspiring Canadian women who create for a living. We talk about their creative journeys and their best business tips, as well as the creative and business mindset issues all creative entrepreneurs struggle with. I'm your host, Melissa Hartfield, and after leaving a 20-year career in corporate retail, I've been happily self-employed for 12 years. I'm a graphic designer, an illustrator, and a multi-six-figure-a-year entrepreneur in the digital content space. This podcast is for the artists, the makers, and the creatives who want to find a way to make a living doing what they love. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the And She Looked Up podcast. As always, I'm your host, Melissa, and this week we have a really big, juicy topic for you. We're going to be talking about perfectionism and burnout for working creatives. And I know this is something that so many of you, probably all of you, have struggled with at some point. We've done episodes in the past on this, but we've never had the opportunity to have a mental health professional on the show. And we have that today. My guest is Yutong Hannah Lin. Welcome to the show, Hannah. Thank you so much for having me here, Melissa. It's a pleasure. I am really looking forward to today's conversation because as I said, this is something that um, is a challenge for all, for everyone, I think, but working creatives definitely can let perfectionism get in the way of producing their work. So, um, and that of course can also lean to lead to burnout. So most of us don't know how to address it though, but before we get into that, let's just get to know Hannah a little better. She is a registered social worker based in Toronto, and she believes in providing inclusive mental health care, which includes making space for converse space in conversation for race, culture, gender, and sexuality. She is passionate about working one-on-one with clients to destigmatize mental health and address anxiety, burnout, and perfectionism. And that is exactly what we're going to be talking about today. So yes, um, Hannah, before we get into that, the first question I ask everyone who comes on the show, whether they're a working creative or not, is did you feel like you were creative as a kid? Absolutely. I feel that um, although my official title is, you know, supporting adult mental health, there are a lot of creative aspects to what I do day to day. And I think that as a child, my creativity was really fostered from uh, two things I can think of. One is my mom, who um, really introduced me to the idea of story, creating stories and telling stories through uh, writing. And as young as five and six, she had introduced me to the concept of uh, diary keeping or writing stories. So I think that really created space where I get to, you know, imagine what a life would be outside of what I see and what I do every day from a very young age. I also think that I was bored quite a bit as a kid. (laughs) And so I wasn't always surrounded with technology or toys. And so I had to use a lot of creativity to imagine what, again, I couldn't see or what wasn't in front of me. And so I would say absolutely um, creativity came somewhat naturally, but I also feel that it was a practice. You know, it was first introduced by a parent um, in terms of how I can be creative and the ways I could be creative. And so saying that, uh, you know, it was first really created, um, an opportunity was created for me to explore what it means to be creative. And then with that, I remember when I was a little bit older, I really explored, you know, the visual arts. So in school, I was really into music and visual arts. And again, that was a space for me where 
things I couldn't see or wasn't in front of me became real. Uh, so yeah, I would say I was very creative as a kid and I continue to take those pieces and imagine what my business could be in my present life, which I mm -hmm. think is really cool. Yes. You are the first person I think who has actually said that, um, that it was also a practice as, as a child. I've never had anybody say that before. So that is really interesting that you actually recognize that, um, looking back on it now. So, um, yeah, because I think as an adult, we talk about having a creative practice, whether it's an art practice, a writing practice, those kinds of things, but it's not something that we necessarily look back to our childhood and recognize that that was part of it. And yet I think it kind of is innately part of being a child is we we don't have the language to say that it's a creative practice as a child, but but it kind of is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when I hear people say I'm not a creative person, I, I just think that it's not that they're not a creative person. It's just that their environment wasn't conducive to them building and practicing that skill. And it's not to say that that person can never become a creative person. Um, and I think maybe that is a bit of a trigger for some people where they think what it means to be creative is so much more. They have to be the top number one artist or <laughs> to that degree. But I think, as you said, it's an innate ability to be creative as human beings. Absolutely. I firmly believe that. I think we all have creativity in us. And I think the ways that creativity come out are different for everyone. I, it's so interesting when I ask this question. It's my favorite question to ask on the show. But so many people will say no. They People who are considered creative as, ad, as adults would say no. They didn't feel creative as a kid because they couldn't draw or paint. And that is like what is so locked into so many people's heads is like, if you can't draw or paint, you're not creative. And yet you can be a creative chef. You can be a creative metal worker. You can be a creative programmer. Like there's creativity in everything that we do. So yeah, very interesting answer to that question. What led you down the path of becoming a mental health professional? Yeah, it's a really great question. And I think um, sometimes I answer this question, you know, the, the simple way, you know, this was something that I just fell into in school and then graduate school and naturally fell into place in terms of my career development. But if I were to be a little bit more insightful, I think I would give the answer of I think it's really due to my experiences as a racialized person, and a person of immigrant status. Um, I came to Canada as a kid with my mom. And so going through the cultural changes, going through the difficult times I had in life, I think those experiences, of maybe subconsciously or consciously to some degree, <laughs> led me to pick a profession where I was really curious about what drives people to do the things that they do, think the thoughts that they have, and how to support them when they're having challenges. So I think it's a full circle moment for me. And I would say that my career is just starting. I, you know, I don't have 20 years under my belt, but if I were to give an insightful answer, it would be fully because of what I've been through is exactly why I am in the career field that I am in now. Is it, is it because growing up and all the things that you went through, you didn't feel like there was, I'm not sure the way to word this, but, um, that there wasn't maybe that support for you or for your mom, maybe, um, or was it that you wanted to hear other people's experiences? Like, how did it all come together in that that way? I think it's still coming together for me. <laughs> I'm still trying to piece together, you know, you know why that uh, it fell into place the way it did. Um, but in hindsight, absolutely, I think that there was a lack of resources from mom because mom was a single mother. You know, she's mm -hmm. trying to make things work. She came to a new country as a skilled immigrant. And for her, it was basically a loss of ability to do what she did back in China, exactly, you know, working in the finance industry, working for banks and carry those skills over to have a similar lifestyle here. That was not possible because her experience wasn't recognized. So that aspect, along with, you know, being a single mom, you know, just making the bills meet and, and, um, and taking care of a young child in a different culture with no support. It's like mm -hmm. obviously things uh, pile up and I think it definitely took a toll on her mental health. And I think um, <clears throat> I didn't, you know, I didn't have the awareness as to what was going on. I just knew I had a great time in school, but sometimes I felt a little sad and like there were just pieces that didn't quite align for me. And I think in hindsight, it's about the loss of culture. It's about the loss of 
um, it's about grieving too. what I could have had had I, for example, stayed in China around family and kept my friends and, you know, not had to learn a new to totally a new language and function as a bilingual person. So all of those pieces, I think I didn't have the words to express what I was going through because I was just going through. I was just young. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it led me to be more reflective of how can I use my experience to help others who don't feel like they belong fully, uh, feel like they can't fully express themselves and be their authentic selves, whether it be due to cultural reasons, uh, reasons or a generational gap between being able to express and communicate uh, with your parents, with their family and friends, and you know those who have issues um, just being able to live their full lives. Um, so that's really what drove me to focus on adult mental health, especially for folks who identify as one, women of color and men of color. It's such an interesting time. My, my mom is an immigrant too. And um, I'm, I'm a first generation Canadian on her side and a second generation on my dad's side. And it wasn't until I became much older that, um, and my former partner is also an immigrant who had to learn a new language at 14. And um, I didn't realize till I got older, just how challenging that was for them. I always had this sense as a kid that something was different with our family, but I really didn't understand how. Um, and yeah, and I, 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 don't think there was that support for people like my mom or for your mom or um, yourself as a kid. And it's not something that you fully process till you get to be a lot older, I think. And and then you start to realize that, yeah, things were, were different and it was hard. And I don't think I realized until I was much older, just how hard it was for my mom um, and just not having anyone like her to talk to. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's it's really interesting that you chose to go down that road as your profession. So um, now that you're out there and you're practicing, um, we're going to dive into this topic of um, perfectionism and burnout and creatives and how that all works. And as I mentioned early in the episode, one of the most popular episodes we've ever done was actually, I think it was like episode number four or five of this show. It was back with my former co-host, Lisa, and it was on procrastination or perfectionism. And it was just the two of us talking. There was nobody who was a mental health professional um, involved in the episode. It was just us talking about how we dealt with these things because we were both we both still are perfectionists and how that tended to manifest itself in our work. For me, it's procrastination. I just, if mm. it's, it's a hundred percent procrastination, but let's start with the basics. How would you define perfectionism? Great question. I think there's so many definitions out there about what it is, and what it's not. I personally think perfectionism and procrastination are best friends. They, they walk mm -hmm. hand in hand. <laughs> um, and so I think for me, perfectionism is really about a state of being. And when this, when a person, myself included, you know, I deal with this too, is there's a tendency to set these standards that the person probably knows it's unrealistic or could only be met with so, so much great difficulty, but yet there is some sort of peace or some sort of soothing, self-soothing. Um, aspect to holding on to these ideals that are not realistic. There's something about keeping this perfection, this ideal that it makes us feel like we're going somewhere. Uh, but we'll get maybe dive into why it doesn't. <laughs> in a bit. Okay, yes, that's um, interesting. I've never heard somebody uh, say that it's almost like a self-soothing peace mechanism. But that's really interesting. It could be. It could be, and yeah. it's not you know the same for everybody. Yeah. I would say that. You know, I would ask myself, you know, if you're a creative and you struggle with perfectionism, ask yourself, what do you think these values you're holding on to around what it means to be perfect? What are these perfect ideals? How do they help you? How does it help you to um, hold these values? Do you believe in your core that it keeps you going, right? Um, and are these core values helpful or unhelpful? So that's something that we get to unpack in therapy quite a bit mm -hmm. with my clients. It's like, what are you holding on to, right? Um, and, and I think all of us have these ideals that we hold on to that we think is very much keeping us going somewhere. 
um, but sometimes it keeps us going in circles. If that makes sense. <laughs> yes, I can relate to that. And that kind of leads me to my next question is, um, how much of our past influences are present when it comes to perfectionism? Like, is there stuff that's rooted back in childhood or teenage years that comes to play in this? I think that's a really great question. I think that perfectionism or other states of being, you know, I think there's a reason why they come to be functionally in our in our adult life, in the current life. And I think absolutely whoever we are in the present, from my training, from my um, just way of looking at mental health, which includes the person's attachment styles as a kid, their experiences as children, I would say that absolutely. Um, and the way that I would go about this is I would ask the person, think about the patterns demonstrated to you as um, for example, with your primary caregivers, whether it be, you know, your parents, grandparents, family members around, you know, how did they react to you when you made a mess? How did they react to you when you made a mistake? How were mistakes and, and um, forgiveness if that was demonstrated at all? Right? How did people repair after um, repair a situation or a relationship when things didn't go the way they thought it would? Mm -hmm. so these patterns are often demonstrated to us starting from a very young age and we pick up signals about how we should be, how we ought to be and how we best to be uh, without really being mindful or being aware because we're so young and we just know that these patterns are the norm. And so, yeah, I would say absolutely it's connected and it takes really a lot of self-awareness to say maybe this is not working for me anymore. Yeah. And it worked for some time, but yeah, to be more critical about your experience. And here we're not trying to blame. We're not trying to blame, you know, whoever was in the past about what they did. Because truly a lot of parents, they, they try their best, but the outcome is that the child wasn't, the care that was given to the child wasn't attuned to the, the child's needs. And so we're not minimizing their efforts nor are we minimizing the pain or, you know, right. the struggles that we currently deal with. I think we have to hold both parts with tenderness here. Yes. No, I do agree. There's no manual for being the best parent. <laughs> um, and I think for the vast majority of us, our parents mm -hmm. did what they thought was best. And, um, you know, it may not have always been the right thing, but that's 20 hindsight is 2020 when it comes to that as well. I think, you know, um, would they have done, would they say they would do things differently now, knowing how things turn out? You never know, right? Um, but I think you're right. I think you have to be kind to both ends of the spectrum. Um, do you think, and I didn't throw this into the list of questions that we were initially talking about, Do you, but do you think this is something that people who identify as women struggle with more than those who identify as male? I was going to say that, you know, um, in thinking about the answer to your last question, I also thought about, well, it's not just about who was there or who wasn't there in your childhood and what mm -hmm. your upbringing was. It's about the greater societal forces at play here. And when we look at things like misogyny and feminism and sexism, all these isms definitely have a role to play play when it comes to prescribing what women should do, what a success for a woman look like, what a mm -hmm. success for a man look like, and then what does success look like for a non-binary person. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes these are prescribed as, you know, these unspoken rules or ways of being in society. And it can be really hurtful when we're told not to talk about it. It's just a way of of doing and not question, you know, this is uh, the way it is. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important to also point out, you know, are these forces influencing you? Have they been influencing you? Um, and I often find that the people that I work with who identify as women have a really hard time um, with perfectionism. They have, whether it be even as uh, simple as not as simple as, but when it comes to work, but also their personal life, right? Friendships, relationships, mm -hmm. feeling like if, if, the, if, for example, they're looking for love and they're looking for a stable relationship, they have to get it right. It has to be perfect. 
And then there's the biological clock. Well, if I don't find my love or the you know, person to be with before I'm 30, then I'm screwed. Yes. So again, it's like, you know, that perfectionist thinking, like it has to be a certain way, mm-hmm. otherwise I've failed, um, is, is really um, just goes also beyond the work that we do, I find. Yeah. Do you find that, that something similar with, with clients or even yourself as, as an immigrant um, um, and I just, as being the child of an immigrant um, that perfectionism has a little bit of a role in there? Um, I just, it's something I've noticed myself. Like it's definitely sort of along the lines of like, you know, there was certain things that were expected because your parents had made these choices to give you a better life. And so you're expected to do certain things to fulfill almost like your end of the bargain, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> so yeah. I think, do you think it plays a role in there? I think it does. I think that parents will say this, you know, with no intention of harm, I came mm-hmm. here to create a better life for you. But as a child, what does that mean? You know, yes. as a you know, teenager, what does that mean? Does it mean that I have to be a certain way so that um, parents are still happy about the decision they made? For example, if I didn't become successful, whatever that means in, in my parents are, does it mean that their immigration um, decision is a failure, you know? Basically, and I think a lot of immigrant uh, parents will come with this idea of, okay, I'm, I came to a different country or a different culture to provide better opportunities for my children. And it's never, again, framed as intention to harm, but I think it can be a very difficult thing to meet in terms of, okay, so how do we know that my child actually ends up having a better life. And is it really within the parent's control? And I, I would say, no, it's not within their <laughs> control, right? And I also call, I also question, because my mom said the same thing to me, right? Right, around, um, you know, uh, I came here to provide better life for you. You can have access to better educational um, education and things like that. And I always ask her, like, why did you make the decision? Because there's got to be something in there for you. And it's about, you know, and I, I'm not a, my, th- my mom's therapist, uh, but I do really care about take um, helping her to take onus of her own life, right? Mm-hmm. It's sometimes easier to say I'm doing this for someone else than to say I'm doing this for myself. Yes. And I think it's really important to turn that narrative around. If, if you truly want to live an authentic life, to as children of immigrants as you know anybody to say i'm doing this for myself um and take that take that onus and take that responsibility because it's easier to i i think deal with the consequences than say than have to have that um place on someone else in terms of expectations of others yes i think sometimes to say we're doing it for ourselves implies some level of selfishness um that maybe we don't want to address and it doesn't have to be selfish at all to do something for yourself. <laughs> so, but I think it's easier sometimes to say that you're doing it for somebody else rather than admitting to the world that, yeah, I'm, I am worth doing something for myself as well. So it's, um, I think you, you said something very, very important there. <laughs> what are some of the sneaky ways that perfectionism can show up for, well, for anyone, but for working creatives in particular that we might not even notice. Like for me, it took me years to recognize that procrastination was me avoiding making a mistake or doing a bad job of something. Absolutely. Yeah. And I agree with you, this, this extends for anybody, but um, I was thinking specifically for creatives and I really try to get into, um, (laughs) what it is that I have trouble with because I identify as being a creative in some aspects of my work. And there's so many. So it could be as, as simple as if I'm if somebody's creating a program or a product or something that has a final, oh, this is done, I'm putting this off to yes. marketing or something next step and never feeling like it's finished. Even though you've given yourself a timeline, like, oh, this year I wanna complete this project, but you're finding yourself either um, not finishing it or never finishing it to the degree that you want it to be. So mm-hmm. that's one way that it shows up. Uh, another way is experiencing frustration and a lot of self-critical talk. Even after spending a lot of time and effort, 
in doing what it is that you're doing. So this is the really the talk around, oh, well, I can improve on this. This needs to be changed and, and that's not good enough. And then this is no longer applicable, but it's never ending. Yes. <laughs> um, it could be as simple as uh, checking, excessively checking emails and communication, especially with those stakeholders. So whatever the stakeholder is in your business, whether it be clients or partnerships and things like that, um, excessively checking the way that you're writing certain responses, making sure the grammar is perfect without, you know, even though it's it's not the end of the world if you make a mistake in an email or even in a conversation. And then excessively thinking about it afterwards too, right? And thinking, oh, could I have said that better? Did I really communicate with uh, what I wanted? I see you're nodding. So I'm I checking all these boxes out. <laughs> <in my head. laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. <laughs> And I think another way that shows up is delaying what you wanted to actually pursue. So let's say you wanted to reach out to somebody uh, for, again, building your contacts, building your business, but you're delaying and making that call or a cold emailing or asking that question because you don't want to appear a certain way, such as I don't want to appear incompetent. I don't want to appear like I'm not good enough, so I'm just not going to do it. And at the end of the day, I think perfectionism really shows up when you can anybody can ask themselves this is am I trying to avoid trying new things that will ultimately help me run my business better Mm, that's an interesting one because I've done that I know so many people have done that and I never associated it with perfectionism but I can Mm. see that now that you've mentioned it yeah that is interesting if you think about it it's like there's a risk of making mistakes and Mistakes are not friends to somebody who, you know, is deep in perfectionism. Yeah. I just tend to say, oh, I don't have time for that, or I don't have time to learn something new, or I've got too many other things on the go right now. But yeah, I can see that. An interesting one that I've noticed with a lot of my clients, because I'm a designer, so I work with a lot of people in in that capacity, I've noticed clients get hung up on the most minute decisions. So Mm -hmm. it could be between choosing between two shades of blue. And the only people who are going to notice the difference between those shades of blue are them and me. (laughs) And nobody else will notice, but that a decision like that can almost cause paralysis in the project. And and it took me a long time to realize it's nothing to do with the blue is everything to do with the fact that they are just not ready to say this is done. So I yeah, agree. that's an interesting one. <laughs> because if if the person is aligned with their values of the work that they want to produce, I think at the end of the day, whichever blue they choose, they will be at, they will make peace with that shade of blue. They will make peace with that decision they make. Even though let's say five down five years down the line, ten years down the line, they change their mind, right? And that's okay too. It's it's not about getting it perfect right from the get-go. It's not about that. Yeah, absolutely. So most of us as working creatives um, or artists, you know, we we want to put out or, or creative service providers, we want to put out high quality work or we want to provide a high quality service. That's that's super important to us. We're trading on our name. Um, and so, you know, attention to detail, excellent artisanship, high level customer service, those are all things that are really important to us. But how do we walk that fine line between producing that quality work and tipping over to the point where that level of quality starts to seep into this, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like this wall of perfectionism that stops us from doing things. Like how do we actually let go of that need to, I don't want to say, <laughs> I'm not being articulate about this. I don't want to say let go of the need to produce excellent work. We, we still want to do that. But at the same time, not getting trapped by this um, idea that it's not perfect. So it's not good enough to go out there because it is kind of a fine line, right? Like, where do you say, okay, this is done. I'm finished. I need to move on to the next thing. That's a really great question. And something you brought up, I think makes perfect sense, right? There, There is this wall of perfectionism. And once we hit this wall, it's like, we're not going anywhere. We're not going any direction, but backwards. And so sometimes what could be helpful if you're finding yourself, for example, um, it's a producing excellent work, you're not producing anything at all. Maybe that's a sign that you're hitting this wall of perfectionism. And so can you invite yourself to take a few steps backwards? 
And so what this can look like is connecting with your supports in your business, not personal supports. That's important too, but specifically for your professional supports, who, who do you have a business coach? Do you have other colleagues doing similar work? Can you reach out to them for that, some of that support? Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes it's about taking a break and stepping away from exactly what you're doing so that you can see things in the big picture again. Because once we lose, I think often when we lose big, uh, the sight of the big picture of why we're doing the work we do, why it's important to us to produce high quality work, we get stuck on the very details of how things ought to be. And so I think it's really important when, when that starts to happen, can you invite yourself to take a step, just pause and maybe take a step back. Yeah, is it because I think it is a, a bit of a fine line sometimes. And sometimes you don't even realize you've crossed it until you do have that moment where you're like, oh, we've never we've been working on this project for six months. It was supposed to end four months ago, kind of thing. So the whole idea of letting go of perfectionism, the need for perfectionism. And I I think this is scarier for a lot of people than anyone's willing to admit or even admit to themselves, like to actually say that I, I am afraid to let go of perfectionism. It sounds like a funny thing to say, right? Like, why wouldn't you let go of it? But and yet it we we struggle with that. Um, but letting go of this need for perfectionism can free us up in ways we often don't expect. Um, our creative, our creativity flows more freely, our work actually improves weirdly um because we're moving through life more freely or um we just we we're not getting so caught up in all those minor details um and i know this is easier said than done but how can we learn to let go of those things um beyond the the short term solution of taking a break going for a walk stepping back from a project how can we learn to let go of those things from a a longer term perspective throughout our creative career as a whole it's a really great question. And as I said before, I feel like perfectionism is a state of being, right? Yeah. If the person um, is in this for so long, it's it's going to be a pattern that comes mm -hmm. up again and again. I think, like as you said, some people even have a difficult time acknowledging this is happening. So I think that's really important to actually acknowledge this is happening and acknowledge the impacts of perfectionism, the negative impacts that it has in your creative life, in your life in general? Can you be honest about what it's do actually doing to you? Is it actually pushing you forward and, and completing excellent work? Or is it debilitating? Is it immobilizing you? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I think people will tell me, yeah, I'm not actually doing anything. I'm stuck. Yep. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> think about it in a critical way, right? Is, is holding these values and beliefs about what perfection even looks like uh, helping me? Yeah. And I think then it's about addressing um, the thinking, right? As I mentioned before, the core beliefs, the thinking that keeps you away from pursuing a life that truly is in alignment with your values. And sometimes we're really nasty with ourselves with that self-talk around what the work ought to look like, ought to be like. And instead of those thoughts, can you replace them with something that is a little bit more realistic? such as all I can do is my best. Mm -hmm. My best today is gonna be different than my best one year from now. Very true. And things like making a mistake does not mean I'm a mistake, does not mean I'm the failure, right? So acknowledging that the self-talk has a really important factor in all of this, I think, could be a way to really address it you know the way we talk to ourselves the way we think about perfectionism and if it actually belongs in our life mm -hmm. and i would say if you're finding that you're stuck in these loops of hitting this wall again and again um is it time to seek for some additional resources to help you whether it be a business coach or a mental health therapist and i think through you know exposing yourself to some additional help you're getting somebody who could walk alongside of you and maybe point out the signs of this could be happening to you before you uh, maybe acknowledge it um, maybe you before, before you acknowledge how it's impacting you in a harmful way just so that there's accountability there as well mm, that's interesting you say that yeah i've been part of a mastermind group for years now. I, I lost track of how many years, five or six, I think maybe, maybe more than that. And it's, it's small. There's five or six of us, depending on 
where we're at. But it's so interesting to have because we meet every month and we talk about like what we're working on, you know, where, where we're struggling, all those types of things. And it's so interesting. You don't realize how many times you've talked about this one specific project that you're going to get out there. And all of a sudden, somebody in the group says, do you realize you've been talking about this for like a year now and you haven't gotten anywhere with it? And all of a sudden, you you don't realize you've been talking about it for a year. And, and it sinks in when somebody else kind of calls you out on it. And it's never done in a mean way or anything, but it's just like you do realize it's been a year and you haven't moved forward. So maybe you need to reevaluate, like, is this the project for you or is there something else going on here? And very often it's something deeper that's happening. You know, you're again, procrastinating. You said, I love that you said procrastination is perfectionism's best friend because, oh my goodness. <laughs> yes. Walk um, hand in hand. Yeah. They do. And I remember hearing um, in a podcast with an author and she mm-hmm. talked about finishing energy when it comes to projects and how it's a very different energy from any other phase of, a, she was speaking specifically about writing novels. And she just said, she is so great at starting energy and the middle energy. And it's the finishing energy. She says, because I've got all the, the I've got the creative part out of me. I've written the story, but it's all the little things like um, the cover design and, and she's self-published. So she's doing all of this herself and, and getting it out there and promoting it. And it's a completely different kind of energy and she struggles with it every time, but recognizing to herself that it's a different kind of energy has helped her deal with it and, and, and almost look upon it differently. And so she tackles it differently than she does the other. And I thought that was really interesting. I'd never heard anybody talk about it that way, but it made a lot of sense to me. It is a different kind of energy. It's sometimes it's doing things that we don't want to do or like to do or, Um, or it means putting the thing out there for other people to look at. That's all part of finishing energy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I found that fascinating. So my favorite word in, um, in in entrepreneurship and creative work is delegate. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I I had a really tough time with this before and I still am working through it. Right. Delegating because I can't be the expert. For everything, there's got to be somebody out there who, for example, does the cover art way better than I would imagine it. You know, does the write up for the front cover way better than I can imagine it. So, you know, get in tune with that. Are you okay with delegating? And if not, what's holding you back? Right, working through some of those mental blocks. Yeah. Um, in the early part of my career after university, I worked in retail and I worked in management, and. I had worked all through university and high school in retail, like as a cashier and, and you know, that those kind of roles. But when I went into management, I remember being pulled aside by somebody from our head office. And um, she just said to me, none of this is your job. She's like, this is not, she's your job is to delegate all these jobs to the people who work with you. That is their job, your job. And it was a very, um, direct conversation (laughs) but it was one of the best lessons I learned and it was still I got very good at it in a retail environment because it wasn't my business you know it was still hard because I always you know like will they do it as good as I did it that kind of thing um but then getting to the point where it was my own business and trying to delegate I had to learn it all over again because now it's my business it's you know I've got that emotional attachment to it that I didn't have and it's, it's hard, but when you get it going, it is the best thing in the world. <laughs> I agree. It is. Once you realize that person you hired to do the book cover did a way better job than you ever could have done. You're like, why, why was I so caught up about this? And yet we do, we let ourselves get really <sighs> tangled up in it. So that leads me to the next question, which is, can perfectionism contribute to burnout? Really great question. I think that it definitely can. I think that there's so many critical ways to look at burnout. Mm -hmm. And I like to look at burnout from a lens where it's not the person per se, but there's, again, so many factors within the society, within the creative field that makes burnout a perpetuated almost like a norm. Like this, you're ought to burn out. This is, this happens every so often. 
And I definitely think those two things are tied. Um, I bet there's research kind of showing or studying this right now about, you know, the details of burnout, like what contributes to burnout and how does perfectionism feed into it. Um, I would say from anecdotal evidence, I think that when the person feels really stuck, right, in terms of not being able to move forward their work, then there's a possibility of questioning the bigger picture. What am I doing? Am I on the right track? Mm -hmm. And doubting doubting self. And I think a lot of creatives who work independently, um, who don't have the support mechanisms in place to prevent burnout, could get there really easily. So what this can look like is feeling as if they lost their purpose in in what they do. Mm -hmm. They feel really drained and have no drive to do anything that's work related. And it may even bleed into some of the personal life um, goals as well. Yeah. I've struggled with burnout multiple times myself. And and the the last time it was so bad that I did have to get help. And it was, um, I I think perfectionism played a role in it. I certainly don't think it was everything that contributed to it, but yeah, it was, it was a very, going through an intense burnout, the, the one that I was in lasted for a year and I learned a lot. It was a really good learning experience. I don't wish it on anyone ever, but I certainly learned a tremendous amount about myself and um, and and the things that I needed to put in place to make sure it didn't happen again. And so maybe, you know, one of the things that I didn't notice is I didn't notice it creeping up on me. I didn't notice it manifesting itself. And so what are some of the things we can look for to help us recognize burnout in ourselves before it gets to the point where it is really crippling? And also, how is that different from feeling creatively blocked? Because I do think those are two different things in my personal experience. I think just from my own experience, because I I have also um, encountered burnout before. And I think people who have encountered burnout, it's not a one time in your life thing. I think it could be cyclical. It could be a pattern. And something to get um, curious about is, is this burnout telling me that there's something that is misaligned in what I do and what I want to be doing or what I should be doing happening? Mm -hmm. And if I ask myself that question for all the times I've burned out before, I would say a big yes. Because I'm a creative person, because I am the person that I am, when my life's work does not align with my values, does not align with my big picture, and I feel that I have to continue because I started something, it causes burnout. It really does. And um, I don't know if I'm going off track to answer your question, but to recognize the way that burnout could happen is, are you getting frustrated with your work, you know, more than usual? Is there a sense of loss of hope in what your future can look like in as a creative in this field? Uh, Do you start self-doubting a lot more, either about your current work or your past work? Right. Was that the right decision? Did I you know, do that right? And how is it different from feeling creatively blocked? I think feeling creatively blocked is more so, maybe in my opinion, more project based or more specifically based on this time or, or phase of, of this project you're working on, less so than this overall feeling of, I don't feel like doing this anymore and I'm really exhausted. No, you didn't go off topic at all there. I think that was um, very, very on topic, actually. And I I know for me, burnout almost veered into full on depression. I, not almost, it did. <laughs> um, but for me, creatively blocked, like one thing I've learned is that my creative energy ebbs and flows, right? It's It, it peaks and, and somebody, um, I've mentioned it before on the show, has referred to it as, as like waves of the ocean. You know, you, when you're riding a wave as a surfer, you, you're on the peak, it's awesome, it's amazing, you're getting that adrenaline rush and, and things are flowing. And, and then, you know, you come down and it, it's quiet. And he said, I had to, he had to learn that the next wave will come. I think for creative block, we always kind of get into this fear. Like I'm never going to create anything ever again. I'll never have another good idea. Um, And it was just recognizing and learning to trust that yes, good ideas will come. It's just, I'm in the, I'm in the, the down cycle of the wave, the, and you can't, if we didn't have ups and downs, everything would be flat, you know, like we would never, everything would feel the same. So you have to kind of have those 
wave ebbs and flows, but the burnout was very different for me. Like that was like you mentioned frustration, feeling drained. Um, I don't want to do this anymore. And you absolutely hit the nail on the head when you said it's, are, are things aligned for me? They were not aligned and I just didn't understand or recognize that they weren't aligned. And I think that's true for a lot of us. And sometimes I think maybe we don't even want to admit they're not aligned, like, because that's scary in itself, because it means making changes. Which... Yes, that's scary. <laughs> How... um, I, mean, I want to go back to what you said about being creatively blocked. Okay. I think sometimes the way we use language is so important, right? So when we talk about, I like the waves example, because when the wave rises, and falls, we don't say that when it falls, there's something wrong with the wave. That's just how waves work. And so even, um, you know, challenging yourself in, in naming these stages in, you, in your work, right? Is it that you're creatively blocked or is this a time for reflection and cultivation of what's to come next? Mm -hmm. And I really learned this lesson actually this summer or this spring when I tried gardening for the first time. <laughs> very strange maybe maybe not so connected but i learned this lesson through gardening when i was cultivating seeds and when i was planting seeds and for a long time nothing came above ground yes <laughs> and i was getting really frustrated and i said to myself like what's happening i i i put the seeds in i did what i was supposed to do and and nothing and the thing is we don't know what's happening underground we can't see what's happening underground Mm -hmm. And it's really about making peace with that time and in, in our creative lives to learn that this is part of the process, that there are going to be times where we are cultivating things that are, cannot be presented, cannot be seen or sold, or it's, it's not a product that we can sell. And there's going to be times where we, through that cultivation of waiting and patience and maybe not doing anything, it seems like that the bloom, the blossom comes. And, and this cycle, I, I really learned through um, gardening and seeing how life in, in biology works in, in real time. It really taught me this lesson this year. Absolutely. I'm a big gardener. So I totally, totally get that um, that that comparison because that's exactly what it's like. It's like, OK, I've planted everything. Dum -dum, you're dumbing your fingers on the counter, you know, like, where's the thing? Um, yeah. yeah. And, you know nature just takes its course. It just does things in its own time and you can't rush them. And that's, it, it's funny, the, the wave thing after hearing that a few years later, I was on vacation in Tofino during storm season. And I, I remember out being out walking my dog on the beach and the, there were surfers all sitting out at various points further. I could see them bobbing along in their little wetsuits and it was cloudy and stormy. And the whole wave analogy came back to me. And I just thought, they're waiting for the next wave, but they were just chatting with each other and having a good time. And they weren't, they were in no rush. Like the wave's going to come and it'll be great. But right now I'm talking with my friends while I wait for it. And it's cool. And surfers are so Zen about things, you know, and I just thought that's it. That's, that's the thing. When the wave is at its at lowest point, that's when you just need to like chill, just relax. It's, you know, get ready for the next wave because it's going to come. So just be sitting there on your surfboard and and be ready to ride it when it shows up. But in the meantime, enjoy the break. And again, that's a an an, an analogy based in nature, because again, you can't rush the waves. So <laughs> um you're teaching so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. A lot of times we know we're feeling burnt out, um, but we're afraid to take the time to address the root problems because for, for a number of reasons. Number one, we, we're self-employed and we need to earn. And the thought of taking a break uh, means we're not going to be earning. And that's that's really scary when you have bills to pay and you have, you know, you need to pay your rent or your mortgage and all those things. But also it's scary because we we know deep down it probably means we need to make some significant changes in the way that we're functioning. So often what we do is we make these small temporary changes. And this was the trap I fell into. I would start to feel burnt out. I would make a few small changes, um, get back on track. I'd feel fine for a couple of months. And then the changes would fall by the wayside and I'd wind up right back where I started. It was very cyclical until it really just got to the point where I couldn't ignore it. How can we break that cycle? How can we, you know, and I know it's a I know that's a big question, but when it starts to become apparent that these small changes are not enough, how do we take the next step? 
Yeah, it's a really great question because the thing is when somebody's going through burnout, they are already so depleted in many ways, whether it be financially, emotionally, and beyond. And what we need the most during this time, I think, is a lot of support, a lot of pouring in of what we've depleted. Mm -hmm. And sometimes this means investing into doing some deeper work. Something that I would be very curious about if somebody is finding themselves going through these cycles of burnout is, would it be important for this person to do some value exploration around what success is to them or what even money values, right? Because so much of what we do is tied with the bills we have to pay, the income. Even though we're creatives, there's that very real aspect of we need to feed ourselves yes. at the end of the day. So I'd be curious about, are there unhelpful narratives that have been happening subconsciously or unconsciously about what success looks like, what it has to be? Are you limiting yourself in terms of the ways that you could be successful? Um, are you scared of success? Right? There's so many ways that um, we hold ourselves back. Mm -hmm. And I think in this time where we're feeling so depleted, I would also ask the person to think about who is supporting you in your business professionally. And if the person can't name three different support systems or people, maybe it's time to think about investing into building the support because we don't do this alone. Even though the, the very much pro, um, producing of the work can feel like a, a solo project, we need pillars in our business, right? Whether it be a, a software that helps us, whether it be a group of other creatives that we can lean into when we need that support, uh, whether it be a coach to work through some of these unhelpful narratives that keeps us from being successful and being even making peace with what we have in terms of success that we have earned, right? Do you celebrate the success that you have earned? I think a lot of creatives are always on to the next thing, on to yes. the next thing, and they Absolutely. recognize I've come a long way since five <laughs> years ago, five months ago. And, and I think the biggest, maybe one of the biggest ways to prevent burnout is to look back um, often, but with eyes of kindness, with eyes of compassion and understanding that this is hard work and doing this not only fulfills your big picture, your values, but you're doing so much more. For some people, it's a very act of social justice that they don't work a nine to five, that they don't follow these norms that society has told us what, you know, mm -hmm. stable job has to look like, what stable professional life has to look like. So honor that for yourself, right? Yeah, I, I think that's very true. And one of the underlying themes of this season of the podcast is defining what success looks like for you, um, not what it's supposed to look like or what everyone else says it should look like or what you're led to believe success is via social media, you know, um, and it doesn't have to look that way. It doesn't have to be about money either. Um, there's so many different ways to measure success. Uh, obviously money is important. We all need, we all need money to get through, to get through the day. But um, sometimes I think we, we constantly get bombarded with the, the six figure launch or the multi six figure launch success story. Right. And you have to have that. So there's so many different ways to look at success. And I think it's so true that when your values aren't aligned and I, you mentioned something else that was interesting that for some people being self-employed is almost like a, a rebellion against the corporate nine to five. And I think a lot of us, when we become small business owners, all of a sudden we notice a year or two down the road that we're actually back to that nine to five, but we're doing it in our own house or whatever. And it's nothing's really changed. And I think that that can make us feel uncomfortable or there's a lot of things that go on when we ignore those things. I, I always know that I always have a gut feeling when something's not quite right. And maybe I can't put my finger on it, but I'm also really good at ignoring those gut feelings when they're not convenient. <laughs> so I have a feeling I'm not the only one. So as creatives and as people who are self-employed, you know, you mentioned, can you identify three supports in your business? And I think that's a big one because I think often when we're self-employed, especially when we're starting out, 
Um, we're trying to bootstrap. We're trying to do it all, all, all on our own because we don't have a budget to necessarily hire somebody or work with professionals or delegate. Uh, and that's, I think, in some ways, the riskiest time of being a small business owner is those early days because we're putting all that pressure on ourselves. But if if there were three mental health practices you would love to see more creatives embracing in their work and their studio life, what what would those be? I think I want to share a practical one, and maybe this mm-hmm. is not rooted in a mental practice, but tied to what we just talked about, where you know we're working on our own oftentimes and. Sometimes people choose this way of life because they don't want to live the corporate life. I think something that's worth exploring is, yes, we may not be working under a manager, we may not be working with a team, but could you still have a performance review with yourself? Mm -hmm. Can you have it with yourself? Yeah, and I think what I would suggest people maybe trying is, can you bring the points that you would if you, if this were to be an actual performance review, right? The the points of contention that you want to bring up to your manager, what's working well, what's not working well, and take some time to do that reflection, whether it be a quarter of reflection, half a year reflection, or a yearly reflection, and then have a dedicated time to sit down with yourself and address those questions, address those points that you do bring up. So if there are concerns that you have as an employee, as a man person, as the only staff, the manager, the aide, everybody, right? Can you help yourself to even just by spending time and sitting and acknowledging, yeah, there's some issues happening here. It's not all smooth sailing all of the time. And is there anything I can do within my power and resources to address some of these um, issues and also to acknowledge the good that has come out of the last period of time? So I would say that was more of a practical um, practice I can suggest for anybody who works, you know, on a small team or by themselves as a creative um, to have that. I like I like that one because I think too, if we had employees, um, and some of us do, we wouldn't want to hear that any of our employees are unhappy or struggling right. or not getting the support they need. We and we would take steps to correct that. At least I hope most of us would. So why should it be any different? for ourselves. So yeah, great point. And I think um, some other practical practices that is easier said than done, I think, include things like, are you taking regular breaks? Is it hard for you to get up from your workstation from time to time? If so, can you block in some time for fun, for joy, for movement, for connection with others? Mm -hmm. And do it, um, because I think a lot of people have difficulty taking time away from their work because they feel like it's it's there's not enough time or it's a waste of time cheating. but can you acknowledge <laughs> what's that it's cheating i i'm this is i shouldn't be yeah. playing i should be working yeah yeah absolutely right, right. <laughs> and so you know if you were again your own boss like taking the lens from being a great manager how can you encourage yourself to take those breaks because we know inevitably those will contribute to your success in the long run your longevity in this in this creative field. And so taking breaks is not just about the 30 minutes that you spend doing something else. It's about how that's a protective mechanism for things like burnout, for things like um, being really critical with our work and, and noticing that, okay, the times that we do step away from our work, there are other meaningful ways we can engage with our life outside of work. Yeah. Have a hobby that has nothing to do with your work. Um, I think this is what entrepreneurs really fall into because if every time we have a hobby, we're always like, because our our natural instinct is to like start businesses, right? So every time you have a hobby that you start to really enjoy, you start thinking, how can I make some money from this? And sometimes you just have to say, you don't need to make any money from it. You can just do the Mm -hmm. thing and have fun and enjoy it and let it be your place to escape. (laughs) So. Ah, uh, small business people are really good at making excuses for everything. <laughs> yeah, so that's two great. Those those are two great suggestions, and I think I interrupted you there with your third one. I think the third one is um, I mentioned about taking breaks, and I listed some examples. I think one of the really important ones is if if the person does not work, or maybe even they work in a creative field where it involves movement of the body, let's say a yoga teacher or instructor it's still very important to engage with your body and move your body in a way that um, 
that one will um, induce this, this basically bring your parasympathetic system online. So the system that um, regulates, you know, the system that is able to stay in the calm when things are, are stressful, right? So movement is, I think, really important. And here I want to differentiate movement from exercise. I'm not encouraging people to go to gyms necessarily. If that's what you love, great. If that's your form of movement, great. But movement can be dancing in your living room. It could be walking your dog. It could be attending to your garden. And those are the things that I think through process of colonization, you know, things that the core of what it means to be human has been taken away from us. So can you find ways and spaces and times where you can just freely move your body, even taking a bath, right? Like mm. fully engaging in, in, in that movement, I think could be really healing. Um, and I think for me, myself, it's, it's really important because I sit in an upright position <laughs> half my day or maybe more. And it's really important to teach my body that this is not all that I do. Yes. Yeah. Very good advice. I just want to mention something because you talked about, you know, the performance review idea and why it's, you know, it's also a good thing to go back and look at how far you've come and the successes you've had and to celebrate those successes. And one of the things I started doing this year, that's made a huge difference is I have a, I have a planner, like, you know, we all have planners, some kind of planning system. Um, mine's paper and pen, but I have this year, I started leaving a, a section of it open where at the end of the day, I would just write down like things I achieved notes to myself. And then every quarter I go through and I look at that note section and see all the things that I've done. And it's shocking to me almost when I do my quarterly review of like, oh my God, I got so much done this, this quarter. Like I, I achieved so many things and maybe they're not huge. A lot of them are small, but they accumulate. And I think without writing those down, I would A, forget about them. I would totally forget about them. And B, sitting down to review them once a quarter and reminding myself, it's made a huge impact on my mental health this year. Like just feeling so much more um, accomplished and like, yes, I am actually moving forward. And, and, and there is, there are things to celebrate here. So I think that has been really helpful to me. I don't know if it would help anybody else out there, but um, certainly worked for me. So I have one more question for you before we wrap up as a mental health provider, how, what are some tips you would give for, if there's anybody out there who's looking to start working with somebody, whether it's a therapist or a coach or something along those lines, what are some of the things that you would recommend they look for? Because I think for a lot of us, when it comes to hiring professionals, whether it's an accountant, a lawyer, a business coach, a therapist, anything along those lines, we don't always know where to start where to look so what do you have any tips for people if they're if they're looking for a little extra support of where they can go to look great question i think um people often compare looking for a therapist as a process of like dating <laughs> and it can be really exhausting to find the right fit um studies have studies have shown that the the one of the greatest factors that therapy works for somebody is that they have really strong rapport with their therapist. Yes. And so what it essentially means is that there's trust there. There is accountability there, right? And so if if that isn't established, then it's it's not likely it's not going to work out longer term. So my question to the person who may be seeking for a mental health support, professional support in this realm is what's important for you to have in a therapist? You know, is it somebody who shared similar life story as you, somebody that looks like you, somebody who's also identifies as a creative? You know, what are some of the must have non-negotiables yeah. that you need in a therapist? And then using those as criteria as you look on online di directories. So psychology today is often a place where people look. Another way to explore is just open up your, your local area, Google Maps, and looking at clinics nearby and reviewing some of the profiles of therapists. There are other, uh, also other directories specific to people of color and therapists of color and trying to connect um, people in need with a therapist who maybe has a similar cultural uh, background. Um, so those, I say those three areas would be potential ways to look for help. 
maybe it's about having conversations around uh, about uh, with friends or family who has a therapist, right? Mm-hmm. Ask them, how did you go about finding your therapist? And, and have you tried out, you know, different ones? And how do you know it was the right fit? And I think through that, through storytelling and through sharing and also exploring on your own, um, hopefully you can find a really good fit. And I think it's an innate um, knowing when you meet the right person, mm-hmm. as you would um, any other circumstance, when you know it's going to work out, I feel like it's almost I'm a gut feeler. Yeah. (laughs) I would like to say that it's, I think a lot of creatives are in tune with that. So lean into what feels safe, right? What feels good in your body, in your mind. Yes. I think that's really good advice. And safe is a good word there, I think, because therapists are, you know, your accountant, you're showing them all your money. (laughs) Your lawyer, you're showing them all your legal issues and your therapist, you're letting them into like, your head. And and those are three very private areas. So when you're looking for a person to, to help you, you want that person who you have that good gut feel about for sure. So yes, thank you um, so much for everything that you've shared with us today, because this, this has been a super interesting um, conversation. I, I hope everybody else enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I certainly got some different perspectives on things, which was super helpful to me. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, tell us a little bit about where people can find you. You do work one-on-one with clients, but you are in Ontario. So um, I believe that's, you You only work with clients in Ontario, if I'm correct. Yes, that's correct. So um, <laughs> my registration is, is technically, you know, I can work anywhere in Canada, but my licensing right now only allows me to work in the province of Ontario. So if anyone who's listening out there who resides in Ontario is looking for a mental health therapist, um, definitely connect with me. My website is my full name. So Yutong spelled Y-U-T-O-N-G, Hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H, Lynn, L-I-N.com. And we will put a link to that in the show notes for sure. Thank you so much. This has been great. Really appreciate your time today, Hannah. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you for this opportunity to talk more about this. Because yes. It's really it's, important. it's a very important topic. Yes. Yeah. And I don't think we talk about it enough, um, unfortunately. And I know that just because every time we do an episode along these lines, it gets more listens than anything else. So it's something people definitely want to hear more about and maybe don't always know how to find that help on their own or or where to go or how to how how to talk about it so if we can put some information out there that helps all of you and that can maybe spur you on to um creating a better mental health circumstances for yourselves then i am very happy that we can do that so this was great thank you all right everyone and that is it for this week i will be back again in two weeks with another brand new episode and we will talk to you all then thanks for listening Thank you so much for joining us for the And She Looked Up Creative Hour. If you're looking for links or resources mentioned in this episode, you can find detailed show notes on our website at andshelookedup.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for our newsletter for more business tips, profiles of inspiring Canadian creative women, and so much more. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the show via your podcast app of choice so you never miss an episode. We always love to hear from you, so we'd love it if you'd leave us a review through iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Drop us a note via our website at andshelookedup.com or come say hi on Instagram at andshelookedup. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.